I'm pleased to welcome you all to this evening of the book launch ceremony of two books. First, we have Eco Criticism Big Ideas and Principal Strategies, written by Professor Swagla Tarangarajan. And then we have uh, Postmodern Literatures, written by Dr. Abhishek Parui. It's indeed an honor and a privilege for me personally to welcome our honorable guests. First, I would like to introduce Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, the director, IIT Madras. Then we have with us today the head of the department, Humanities and Social Sciences, Professor Umakan Dash. Third, we have uh, here Ms. Padmaja Anna, she is the vice president, Humanities Publishing Unit, Tori and Black Swan. Then we have uh, Professor Pramod K. Nair. He comes from School of Humanities, University of Hyderabad. We have Dr. Michael Yetz. He's the Associate Professor, College of Arts, Rikyo University. I request all our dignitaries to come up on the dais and get their seats. Then I would request the authors with us today, Professor Swangla Tarangarajan and Dr. Abhishek Parvi to join the guests on the dais. To see our guests and the dignitaries on the dais is indeed a happy occasion for all of us. On this note, I would request our students, Shiji Mariam and Mohit Sharma, to greet our guests with a small token of appreciation. Thank you, everyone. So uh, before we begin with the formal sessions, I have a small tiny story to tell about the book launch event that we are hosting today. It's really interesting to see two of our colleagues. They are coming up with their books together, and they're hosting it at the same time on the same occasion. So um, it's definitely heartening to see the friendship and the camaraderie that they share. And I would like to share with all of you that it's Swarna, it's Professor Swan Lata whose book released, um, I think, in February. And then she waited for Dr. Abhishek's book, which was scheduled to come out in August. And interestingly, both the books are released by or published by the same publisher. So um, it was kind of a good occasion. And when both the colleagues are coming up together and they're teaming up to host this occasion, it's definitely a wonderful thing to see. We would like to see how the books are. And for that, we definitely need a uh, need kind of an unwelling ceremony. And for that, we would um, like to request our students Mohit and Ranjini, Mohit and Shiji, to bring the books here. And I request our director, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, to unveil the books and to give the first copy to our head of the department, Professor Umakan Dash. Professor Ramurthy for this, for gracing the occasion and for unveiling the book. So uh, to begin with the formal felicitation ceremony of the books, I would like to request our director to share a few words on this very special occasion. Very good afternoon to all of you assembled here. 
So my job is to keep count of all the books and papers that the faculty and students of this institute write every year. Right? It's one of the tools by which we harass our students. We write the papers and then we give it to them and tell them to read it and give seminars on the books and papers. Actually, I found uh, when I went to, as a student to the U.S. long ago, it was uh, one, one uh, step worse there. They actually make all the students buy the books. <laughs> so I'm sure the publisher will be happy with that. But uh, So in India, of course, we don't do that. And in IIT, students pride themselves in getting through the whole degree without buying any books. <laughs> so at least for all of us, uh, it was, you know, the number of books you had to buy to get whatever grades you got uh, was a sign of uh, weakness. We prided ourselves in our ability to study from notes or not study at all. So, you know, I obviously had not read these books uh, running around, running ragged. So, but anyway, I think um, you know, I'm just trying to understand some of these words. I'm I was just trying to get, uh, wrap my tongue around the, the title of this keynote today. Uh, so, Prosopis is what I know on campus. Does it have anything to do with it, sir? No. Okay. So, because that is my nightmare. So, <laughs> we have 150 acres of it. But uh, uh, more seriously, I think, uh, you know, I, uh, I do not claim to understand uh, anything about uh, what uh, these books are about. Uh, maybe one day I'll get around to trying to do so, uh, trying to understand something. But uh, I'm sure for uh, students of these subjects, uh, students of these faculty, people who take these courses, these books uh, will uh, be, you know, a delight to read. You will a great learning experience. And I hope a trigger also for each one of them to launch off into their own uh, diverse research careers if they're going to do research or writing careers as the case may be. So I really don't have anything else to say except that uh, as I said, for us as a university, uh, our <coughs> rightly or wrongly, our output, our uh, uh, our uh, uh, the uh, what we do uh, by way of research or by way of uh, extending the grandiose way of saying it front frontiers of knowledge uh, is measured rightly or wrongly by the num by the publications and the quality of the publications. Uh, from what, it, from what I gather, just by seeing some of the, uh, pre the I did read the preface, so uh, it does appear that these are works of very high quality. So I commend my colleagues for uh, the effort they've put in. I also see that they are kind on their students. The books are not as fat as some of the ones we write in the engineering departments. Uh, of course, they are full of problems and all that, but I mean, worked out problems and so on. But still, uh, these seem to be rather, uh, one semester type of books. So I uh, I think on behalf of the students, I thank them for the uh, for the fact that they have not written heavy tomes. And uh, I congratulate them once again and wish them, uh, wish that, uh, you know, they will keep up the writing and uh, we'll have some books like this every year. Thank you. So um, now moving on, uh, I would like to request our head of the department, Professor Magandash, to share a few words with our audience. Thank you, Anandita. Uh, respected uh, Professor Ramurthy, Professor Nair, uh, other dignitaries on the dais and down of the dais. Uh, this is uh, the best movement for the de department when some of our faculty colleagues, uh, they come up with new books and uh, we release the books. I think in the last one year, we have got, it's a good number of uh, uh, books being published and um, say released. So I, uh, first of all, I congratulate uh, uh, Avisek and uh, Swarna for their uh, individual books and also for their, as Anandita pointed out, their fellow feeling. So coming, forming a team and waiting uh, for the other person to say come up with the book. Uh, say hope if, if we continue, this is going, uh, in a couple of uh, years time, we are going to be one of the best department in, uh, in the IIT fraternity in India at least. So. Uh, and I'm sure uh, though the book is thin, the content wise it is going to be as equally a heavy dose than any in the other engineering department. So uh, with these few words, I uh, hand it over and I wish them all the best and hope to see many more books in future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Das. I'm sure there are more colleagues waiting out there to come up with new ideas in the new books. And we are looking forward to many more from this department. 
Um, so uh, we have a very special guest with us today. So she's Miss Padmaja, and she's, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction thing, she um, is the she's working with uh, Orient Black Swan in the humanities publishing section. She's going to talk about the series that she has edited and two different series which have published. Professor Swarna and Professor Avishak's book. And she's also going to give us an idea what is the theme of the book and how this can be beneficial for the academic fraternity sitting here and beyond this room. So we welcome Padmaja ma'am here. Thank you and uh, apologies in advance in case my voice doesn't go over it. Uh, Orient Blacks was very, very happy and proud to be here on this very happy occasion. I won't take very long, just wanted to introduce the two series to you. Eco-Criticism, which uh, Swatna has authored, is actually the fifth book in the series called Literary and Cultural Theory. And uh, it started about five years ago. And although we published five, we have commissioned 22 titles in the series. So there is a lot to look forward to. And um, the books, actually, we, you know, the idea arose because we wanted very lucid, simple, concise introductions. That explains why the book is so thin. The idea was that it should be concise and give students an overview, a very current contemporary overview of the subject. So it helps you understand what there is and you can choose how deep you want to go into each of those subjects. Now, traditionally, a lot of literary cultural theory books are printed under license from publishers abroad. And the examples that they take in their texts are often not widely taught in India. So the idea was also that the series would include examples of books, of texts that are widely taught within India and are meant specifically for Indian students. So we hope that uh, you, you kind of see that that's what the books are and do give us feedback on these books. Now, each uh, book is conceptualized as a collaborative project between the series editor and the author. So we, the idea was also to pair a senior with a, you know, a new uh, talent here in India to give Indians their own place under the sun in literary cultural theory. Uh, the other book, Avishek's book, belongs to a very, very unique series called Literary Contexts. I must add that for the Literary Cultural Theory series, although Pramod is not part of the Board of Studies informally, he has mentored us, he has advised us, he's been a sounding board for this series. But for uh, this Literary Context series of which Avishek's book is a very crucial volume. Pramod is the series editor. The idea was to take canonical areas in English literature and look at what shaped, you know, how ideas um, shaped a theory, an age, a context, and how literature grew out of not an isolated, you know, uh, idea from an author or a few authors but the fact that ideas grow out of their time. So these books bring those ideas together. In my time, we used to have to wade through books in literature and we had no, you know, we had to work very hard because books were very difficult to access to find out what connected with what, how the ideas connected together. These books help you do that very, very concisely. So I really hope that you will find these two books extremely useful. I don't want to stand. So the two books that are being released today have actually been a dream ride for Orient Black Swan, thanks to you know their commitment to deadlines, their open-mindedness in accepting the ideas that publishers put through. 
So on behalf of the editor, Srinath Yashita, I'm very grateful to both of you for your cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so uh, I just mentioned also in, uh, in line with what Padmaja ma'am ma has just shared, these two books, they are coming from two different series. And we have with us today one of the series editors here, Professor Pramod Nair. We are going to listen to him a little later. And uh, he's going to deliver a special lecture on prosopography, as Professor Ramurthy was mentioning a while ago. But before that, I would like to invite a special guest with us today, uh, Professor Michael Yetz. So um, he's Avishek's friend. And we had a, a session, like our students had a session uh, with him a few days back. And he comes from Rikyo University. So let's welcome Professor Michael Yates to, uh, and let's see what his words are about uh, the books that he has read. Yeah. So we'll try not to use up too much time. Uh, Avishek told me that I have a maximum of three minutes. So <laughs> I'll completely disregard that. Um, but I do want to make a couple of comments, um, hopefully to synthesize um, these two works. I haven't finished reading them, but I have read their introductions and I found them uh, incredibly seductive in their arguments. Um, and I think there is a lot of overlap between these two areas. Um, as uh, Dr. Paruri brings up in his introduction, uh, so much of postmodern discourse is built on um, heterarchy, right? So it's a movement from hierarchy of, of modernism towards the heterarchy and anarchy of, of the postmodern. And I think eco-criticism borrows some of that uh, in its sense of the rhizomatic structure of discourse. Um, so in a certain sense, they're, they're very directly related. And um, as uh, Dr. Perui brings up in his work as well, um, uncertainty versus uh, certaintylessness is at the core of the postmodern uh, discourse and, and way of criticizing culture and, and the text. Um, and that sense of certaintylessness has its own kind of spectrum of unknowing that, um, in my perspective, uh, runs from a certain kind of anxious doubt all the way towards this onto-epistemological complete disconnection, or what uh, Roland Barthes might call the receivable, which is the red-hot text, the, the unknown. And I think the idea of the anthropos uh, Anthropocene, I still can't get that word out correctly. I think the, the whole idea of the anth Anthropocene, am I getting that right? Okay. Um, also has uncertainty at its core. And this uh, certaintylessness of uh, eco-criticism is its object, especially in the sense that we have now as humans gotten to the point where we can kill ourselves as a race, as a species, and, and other species along with it. But with that awareness comes the question of what now? And I think uh, many of the theories that are discussed in her book uh, offer the various approaches that people are taking at the moment. But I think that is still a central question. And I think we get some of that discourse from postmodernity. But what worries me is that if eco-criticism continues to borrow from postmodernity and to use postmodern theory as its uh, basis, we'll end up uh, we'll end up not answering the question because I think the the core of the postmodern, the the core of that critical approach to the world, to philosophy, to everything, is a essentially ironic sense of uh, duplicity. And I find that eco-criticism might be at risk if it continues that ironic sense. And uh, it's only in moving past that that we can have any kind of sincere engagement with the questions that we're confronted with today. And I think both of the works um, that we're celebrating today uh, have engaged with those questions in very meaningful ways. So I'm very happy to be a participant in this book launch. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yates. So um, as you just mentioned, um, obviously bringing it together and holding the uh, event together 
it's definitely a big deal for all of us and it, it sets a standard for for the rest of us to understand or to figure out how to work together and how to come up with uh, this team spirit. So uh, now is the time to listen to the authors. Uh, let me make it very clear, writing is never an easy job. So those who have written books, those who are thinking to write, and those who are dreaming to write a book, they all should know that this could be extremely tedious and it would give you sleepless nights. You're going to get a lot of stress and anxiety attacks. So to under, like to remember and to understand what kind of journeys that our authors have been through, I would like to request Professor Swanlata and Dr. Parui to share their experience. So uh, we invite Professor Swanlata first. Yeah. Thank you, Ani. And thanks to everybody for coming here and being with us today. Uh, it's rather difficult to talk about the writerly process because I think that's the agenda that Ani had in mind because the roots of this book go back to the year 2006 when I joined this department as an assistant professor and launched a, B a course for the BTEC. It was a BTEC elective called Literature and the Environment. And also the year 2008 when I became the founding editor of a journal, Indian Journal of Eco-Criticism. So um, this book has been formed, Terra formed by IIT Madras and in a sense, this book belongs to people, places other than humans who live on this beautiful campus, who belong to this beautiful campus. So um, a short and imperfect summary of acknowledgments would be as follows. I begin with my original wingmates, um, Professor Suresh Babu, HSB 332A, Professor Srilata, <laughs> HSB 332B, Professor Jyotir Mai Tripathi, HSB 332D. These people teased out the green thread in me using humor, debate, encouragement. I think they were the first to pronounce me an eco-critic when I was working away hard in 332D, uh, taking baby steps in the field. So the book belongs to them. The book also belongs to my BTEC students who took the course, who would debate with me furiously after the class got over, raising pointed questions about how um, ecological problems can be represented in cultural spaces. And I think these early classes helped me think deeply about eco-critical practice, praxis also. This book belongs to my PhD scholars, my first scholars here today, Dr. Vidya Sarveshwar, and thanks for coming. Uh, all my scholars who have specialized in the domain, I'm constantly learning from them. This book belongs to my MA students who've done their MAPs, MA projects in eco-criticism. Uh, today, I especially remember a student of mine, Bhargavi Surya Narayanan, who did an MAP on women writing nature with me. Bhargavi was a very passionate person. She read passionately, she wrote passionately. Whatever she did, she infused with her quiet conviction. She's no longer with us today. We lost her to the Thani fire accident early this year. I dedicate this book launch to her memory. This book belongs to pa pa Padnaja Anand. She waited patiently for me two years because I didn't commit to the project. I was working on other books and I kept telling her it'll be a conflict of interest, but she waited for me. Thanks so much for that. It belongs to Srinath, Ishita, a wonderful team. Um, this book belongs to Professor Scott Slovic. I thank Orion Black Swan for putting me in touch with a foundational eco-critic, somebody who has shaped the domain right from its inception in the 1990s. It was a huge privilege working with him. Um, well, uh, the last, not the least, this book belongs to Professor Pramod Nair, a fellow eco-critic who has contributed to my journal, to my books without even having met me. Um, we had this academic um, association for over a decade I think I got to meet him the first time two months ago during the Victorian conference held in this department. Uh, so it's wonderful that we have here, uh, him here uh, with us today. Uh, thank you. And 
There are many others whom I have not spoken of because of the shortage of time. So thanks to everybody. So Swadna has already shared her share of experience and then the acknowledgement. So we have um, another author here, a new faculty. And I remember when Swadna mentioned this, like she wrote an email to all of us mentioning that, okay, the book has been released. And immediately Abhishek's response comes, okay, so there is another book which is coming from the same uh, publishing house. And immediately both of them, they started uh, talking about holding the function together. So uh, now since whatever could, could have been the writerly experience or the writing experience for, for the authors here, I'm sure um, when we are holding this function, they, both of them, they have uh, got to say something, how uh, this process has been fruitful and how they are going to, uh, how, how, what kind of experience have they had? So after listening to Swarna, now it's time to listen to Dr. Abhishek Parui, so I welcome him here. Thank you very much, uh, Anindita. It's a great pleasure to see all of you here. Thank you so much for turning up and making this into such a happy occasion. At the very outset, uh, I should thank the department, uh, Professor Uma Kandas, my colleagues in the English stream, uh, Swana, as you know by now, who very, very kindly waited for more than six months for my book to arrive, just so we can do this together at the moment, uh, by the way we're doing now. And I'm really indebted uh, for that gesture. It's, it's a wonderfully warm and human gesture. Uh, which obviously reflects the wonderful collegial spirit we have in this department. And of course, a great thank you goes to the OBS uh, team, Ishita Chatterjee from Calcutta, who is uh, proof editing, uh, proofreading and editing my book, uh, Padmaja Anand, uh, a very, very uh, patient and kind editor uh, of this particular volume. And of course, Professor Primal Nair, who we'll, uh, we'll all listen to in a moment, uh, who has been essentially one of those uh, mentor figures for me uh, ever since I started my academic career. Uh, so I owe a lot to him. So I think a, a brief thank you would not suffice uh, in terms of what I uh, owe to this uh, wonderful person. Uh, in terms of thanking the students, of course, I've learned a lot. I continue learning from my en engagements and interactions with all the students I happen to meet, uh, BTEC, MA, PhD students, um, very, very engaging conversations, uh, a lot of which went into the book uh, in forms of direct text. Uh, so thank you to each and every one of you, uh, interlocutor, audience, uh, students, who have essentially shaped uh, this book. Uh, lastly, I just want to thank a little bit, talk a little bit about the essential writerly process which went into the making of the book. I enjoyed uh, reading up all the old classics, Spiegelman, Calvino, uh, Richley, uh, and Martin Amos, but at certain points while writing this book, I often thought uh, that it could actually be a bit of an existential uh, joke. They're writing a book on postmodernism, which is you know entirely about breaking down of narratives uh, and doing away with any engagement with creating any grand narrative. And I sort of think, what? How does a book feature in this scheme of things? So it all sometimes ends up being a bit of a self-defeating joke. Uh, and of course it is. Of course it isn't, as Thomas Pynchon would say and Gravity's Rainbow. But that taught me something which uh, I probably always knew about postmodernism, as that is, uh, postmodernism is perhaps nothing if not an activity in ambivalence. And I don't mean ambivalence in the sense of uncertainty. I mean ambivalence in the sense of uh, the possibility of producing possibilities. Uh, in terms of having multiple possibilities, plural possibilities. So I think that is probably the only modest message that I want to convey in this very slim book. Actually, it's less than 180 pages. It is very, very slim and minimalist. But if there's one message that I've so attempted to convey, it is that we need to embrace an articulate ambivalence, uh, perhaps now more than ever, uh, in the world we live in today. So that has been my attempt. And uh, lastly, last if not least, uh, I must thank, and I will thank, uh, two wonderful people who have shaped not just this book, but in many sense, the way I think. Uh, my wife, Priyanka, who's sitting right at the back, and my little infant, uh, Oyunish Pari, uh, who is blissfully sleeping, mercifully sleeping, thank God for that, uh, who happens to share his birthday with James Joyce. A lovely, lovely design, I think. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, the authors. And then uh, we are moving over to the next section of the event. No book release function is ever complete without reading the excerpts from the book. So we have two students uh, here. Uh, we have Bridula Robert and Ranjani Srinivasan. Bridula is going to read um, from Dr. Abhishek's book, Postmodern Literatures, and Ranjani will read from Professor Swanlata's book, Ego Criticism, Big Ideas and Practical Strategies. So I welcome Bridula first to do the honor. Samuel Beckett's Endgame begins with the character Clove pronouncing. Finished 
It's finished. Nearly finished. It must be nearly finished. Looking back from 2018, one is tempted to speak of postmodernism in similar terms as a project that must nearly be finished. However, Beckett's line in itself contains the productive paradox that underpins much of postmodernist poetics. It is a project that is almost always nearly finished. And unlike the unfinished project of modernity described by Eugen Habermas, the unfinished project of postmodernism is not in opposition to its ontological extension, but rather emerges as an affirmation of it. For postmodernism is nothing if not an unfinished Beckettian play, forever marked by interstices and interruptions that espouse reversals instead of closures, cyclicality instead of linearity, with a disregard for any metaphysical meta-narrative of meaningful productivity and closure. Postmodernist poetics frequently shuns any neat sense of beginning, middle, and end, and frequently defies the logic of spatiality and temporality. Postmodernism eschews any eschatological understanding of the world and relies instead on the immediately local and textual. It is often produced by contested and contesting categories of knowledge, seldom aiming for a sense of an ending. In a postmodernist sense, postmodernism is perhaps almost always ending, will perhaps never fully end. This book has made an attempt to trace the trajectory and various narratives of postmodernism through a study of selected literary texts. It has examined postmodernism's entanglements with history, technology, gender, and race, among other issues, while also attempting to describe some of the key features recurrent in postmodernist poetics. Special attention has thus been given to the metafictional, intertextual, and heteroglossic qualities of postmodernist texts that offer a complex interplay of real and virtual identities, sometimes further problematized by irony and performativity. This book has also attempted to explore the self-consciousness that informs postmodernist descriptions of noise and nonsense that inconsistently unsettle meaningful sounds and meta-narratives of meanings. It is unsurprising, as the book, this book has hopefully managed to examine, this, that postmodernism has found its ideological allies in feminism, post-colonialism, and post-humanism in their shared suspicion of any metaphysics of essence. With its celebration of simulation, promotion of textuality, and alliance with interstitiality, Postmodernist literature has been a potent tool to unsettle the archaeology of authority and knowledge that had historically and discursively informed ideas of supremacy at political as well as epistemic levels. With its self-reflexivity and certainty-lessness, its extended worlds and immersive interiority, postmodernism offers the possibility of a radically novel understanding of moral phenomena in its scope and function its increasing significance in the real and virtual worlds we inhabit today can hardly be overestimated. Thanks, Pridula. So I request Ranjani to read from Swarna's book now. Before I studied Zen for 30 years, I saw mountains as mountains, waters as waters. When I arrived at a more intimate knowledge, I came to the point where I saw that mountains are not mountains and waters are not waters. But now that I've got to its very substance, I am at rest. For it's just that I see mountains once again as mountains and waters once again as waters. This step-by-step -step discourse on enlightenment attributed to the 12th century Chinese Zen master Xin Yuang defines a satori moment in which all conceptual level differentiation breaks down, giving way to the realization of the uniqueness of all beings in the field of non-dichotomized existence. Are the three understandings the same or different? Asks the master at the end of the discourse. This is a question relevant for our troubled environmental times. The point is to learn from nature, to enter into its spirit, and to stop trying to impose upon it the arbitrary constraints which result from our belief in our own importance. The master passes through stages of ecological enlightenment. In the beginning, he takes nature for granted. 
He then goes on to reduce nature to a mere construct of the mind, a sign within the signifying system, and in the end, realizing his folly, enters into a larger enlightenment, which includes mountains and waters, as well as minds. This expository book on eco-criticism, a vodomecum of sorts for new initiates in the field, emphasizes the importance of recognizing the multiple roles nature can be called upon to play in ecological and literary discussions. The world we live in is witnessing a radical eclipse of nature in which even the timeless natural order cannot be taken for granted since nature has been relentlessly modified by humans. Hence, environmental narratives that characterize our times have abandoned the romantic return to an Edenic myth and are increasingly turning towards a truly materialist vision that articulates dispossession, loss, mutilation, extraction, miscegenation, disease, and a whole host of themes that characterize the dark thanatos of environmental pollution, eco-catastrophes, toxicity, and slow violence. There are innumerable ways that these narratives connect the personal and political, the home and the world, the rural and the urban, human and the more than human, man and the machine, the local and the global planetary in a manner similar to the complementary and symbiotic networks of biodiversity. What is nature? What is humankind's relationship with nature? Where does nature begin and end? The preceding 10 chapters of this book offer an extended meditation on these questions by familiarizing readers with a wide range of positions in the field. Bioregionalism, urban ecocriticism, ecofeminism, postcolonial ecocriticism, environmental ethics, material ecocriticism, queer ecocriticism, post-human ecocriticism, and eco-cinema studies. The diverse approaches outlined by these positions reveal that there are core ideas, principles, and practices all over the world that transcend cultural boundaries and help us enter free narrative spaces. One of the most important functions of eco-criticism is the liberation of our imagination to use our creative power to enter free narrative spaces that are more or less liberated from controlling stories. It is only in these open space visions that the alternative tales of sustainability, earth democracy, subjecthood of nature, indigenous rights to land, and a whole host of issues can be given free expression. Thank you, Mridula and Ranjani, for reading the excerpts from the book. So, from both the books, in fact. So, um, now we are uh, heading towards another very important section of the event. As has been mentioned by uh, Padmaja Ma'am and others, also Swarna and Abhishek, they have mentioned Professor Pramod Nair is with us today. And he has been what we call a sutradhar, or the sounding board, who has brought the academics together and they have started uh, working on both the books. So the books are uh, the, like they are part of two different series. Abhishek's book is listed in uh, literary and cultural theory, literary and cultural theory series, and Swarna's literary content. Okay, just the other way around. So Swarna's book is in literary and cultural theory, and Abhishek's is in the literary context. So, um, Professor Nair is here and he has been the series editor for the later. And uh, I'm going to just give a brief introduction about Professor Nair here. He comes from the Department of English, School of Humanities, University of Hyderabad. He has been a serious academic who has been writing, publishing numerous number of books and journal articles. The most important thing to mention here is that Due to his immense contribution in the field of humanities research, Professor Nair has been awarded with the Visitor's Award for the Best Research in the category of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences for the year 2018. And this award has been presented to him by the Honorable President of India, Sri Ramnath Kovind. Today, he is uh, here to deliver the keynote address or the special lecture and the title has been the uh, matter of discussion for a while. I hope I'm going to pronounce it in the right manner. So this is uh, prosopography, nature culture in contemporary India. So uh, let's welcome Professor Nayar to talk about the guest lecture that has been listed here. Good evening, everyone. I feel like a bit of an interloper here. This day actually belongs to Swarna and Avishek. 
Um, so I don't quite know what I'm doing there, except indirectly that uh, I was instrumental in uh, Avishek's book. And I'm happy to be here um, with uh, the IIT team, um, friends, Avishek, Swarna, Srilata, Meryn, Divya, and other friends, uh, not of the IIT, Saraswati Rajagopal and Archana, uh, who are also here. Um, a couple of things I think are in order about uh, the books themselves before I venture forth on my topic um, with a rather puzzling title. Um, the problem with asking Avishek to write a book is that he'll write it. Um, in the case of most other uh, authors, as I think Padmaja would be uh, able to unofficially corroborate, they don't deliver the book. So everybody promises to write, but authoring in India is a very deconstructive phenomenon. It's always perpetually deferred. The writing never happens. Uh, tomorrow I will hand in the book. Next year I will give in the book. The book never comes. So unless we have taken it literally that the end of the book marks the beginning of writing as Derrida warned, Indian authors are a classic uh, boa deconstructor species. Um, Avishek doesn't belong to that category. So this might be of some interest to our resident eco-critic Swarna, what species Avishek belongs to, but he, <laughs> but he did write the book, um, which uh, was fantastic for us, primarily because I did not want to entrust this particular text to anybody else in the country, and I could not find an author for this. Um, I un unofficially sounded out many people, and what they told me did not sound like postmodern, did not sound like literature, and was certainly not about contexts. So we did have a bit of a problem with uh, commissioning this. Uh, when I asked Avishek and he said yes, and I looked at it, it was a slightly different book within that same series, actually. If you pay close attention to it, it's not of the same kind as the other titles that have released. Um, for the reasons I think which he captured and others have captured when they spoke about uh, the uh, book itself, the intellectual currents, and as he emphasized the question of ambivalence and uncertainty in epistemological problems. Uh, okay, that's long enough words for one round. The more's coming in my paper, so I'll let that go. Um, but the point is, um, Avishek's book was by far one of the most challenging ones to look at and examine. Uh, at some points, we had some doubt as to how it would go for the student reader that was the target audience, our BA uh, level audience, uh, because of what the matter was and the mode in which that matter was delivered. I'm happy to say it matches what we thought would be the kind of book for a BA audience, but also exceeds it in several places which is why I said it's a remarkably different book from the series. I have absolutely no hesitation in thinking that this will be uh, fantastic and that should make uh, good music to Padmaja's ears, a best-selling volume. Uh, all right, uh, do you agree? <laughs> right, yes. Um, so uh, congratulations to Swarnalata and Avishik. Swarnalata, like uh, she said, uh, we met for the first time in June, but we have known of each other for a, for a while now. Uh, I'm not as green as she is. Uh, how uh, you want to take that comment? Um, um, uh, but she has consistently worked, and that's something remarkable because consistency is not something uh, as a word that has ever been associated with me. So I'm always envious of people who stay within a discipline and manage to be productive through and through. Um, I would die of sheer exhaustion if I had to do just one field. And to be productive, and not like several of our uh, other resident Indian academics who, who claim expertise in 16 areas and produce work in none. Um, uh, Swarnata has managed to do that, and that is a fascinating um, piece of career writing corpus. So congratulations to you two, and it's been a pleasure being here. That said, um, the title, of course, has been puzzling. Um, prosopography is collective biography, and it comes from the trope prosopopia, face-making. So it's a term that has been adapted for 
any biography of a tribe, a community, an ethnic group, and what it does. My interest in this uh, comes from a different agenda, actually. Um, this is a part of a paper commissioned by Autobiography Studies, the journal, for a special issue on one of my uh, favorite commentators, critics, Donna Haraway. So the special issue on Donna Haraway asked me to do something on an area in which I have done some work before, genomics, culture, and culture studies. In 2003, Donna Haraway coined a neologism with her nature culture. Haraway alerts us to the implosion of nature and culture in the relentlessly historical, spe historically specific joint lives of dogs and people who are bonded in significant otherness. Those who know uh, uh, IIT has its animal life in the class and outside it. Uh, many in the liminal spaces uh, there in the University of Hyderabad English Department, we have a resident dog who attends all our classes, faculty meetings, board of studies. <laughs> and at some point, I, I think Avishek has met the first one, we now have another one. At some point, we expect him to bid for a faculty position as well. <laughs> Considering what we get as faculty, it will not be a bad choice at all. Examining the data on dog evolution and the history of domestication, Haraway notes how wild wolves drawn to the calorific value of human waste moved closer to human habitation. Humans controlled the growth rate of dogs by killing some puppies, feeding some bitches and not others, and changed their life in association with dogs, even as the dogs co-evolved with humans and human cultural practices, including agriculture. Haraway's emphasis was on companion species, the title of her later volume, a Companion Species Manifesto. Even as she demonstrates how culture frames nature and nature responds to culture, so that each is deeply enmeshed within the other. Thus nature, culture, nature and culture are inseparable in their ecological relationships, which are biophysically and socially formed. Decades before this influential conceptualization of nature culture, Haraway had argued for the embedding of science, genetic and biomedical research, their findings and policies in social settings, primate visions 1989, simians, cyborgs and women 1991 and elsewhere. Even accounts of genetic citizenship with its genome sequencing, Haraway indicates must be linked to cultural apparatuses, especially those that might render certain populations vulnerable, not to disease alone, but to the absence of healthcare. We will return to this theme in a while. As an example, Haraway writes of the diagnostic tools for Tay-Sachs disease. The quote, the key is the community's relation to the test and its technocultural apparatus. The Ashkenazi Jewish community in New York City has virtually eliminated the birth of babies with Tay-Sachs disease by first supporting research and then using a gene test, even while affected children continue to be born to other communities around the world with very different relationships to the cultural apparatuses of research, medicine, and genetic citizenship. This insistence on the technocultural has remained the cornerstone of Haraway's work. And uh, it's partly due to Swarna's book in this, uh, uh, in, at, at, the, at the launch that I chose this topic. It, it does connect to the question of nature and culture and how we read them together. This um, talk examines an emergent scientific narrative of genetic citizenship and its nature culture paradigm in contemporary India. It demonstrates how the genetic life story of a community, it's a genetic prosopography, uh, in keeping with Haraway's insistence on socio-culturally embedded science may be read in terms of what I'm calling cultural genomics. In Primate Visions, Haraway noted that scientific practice is above all a storytelling practice in the sense of historically specific practices of interpretation and testimony. The scientific practice of gene databasing is embedded then in the 20th century world's shift to the molecular interpretation of life, where it treats nuclear acids as the code of life, or sometimes called the book of life. Um, the gene is only a part of the story. It predates as a term modern DNA studies and only refers to a segment of the DNA that codes for a specific protein. Thus, any scientific statement of the world depends on language, Donna Haraway. The 20th century has discovered this language in the scriptome, in the chemical basis. Genomics, argues Thomas Kausa, the influential theorist of autobiography, will influence life writing. Uh, that is, all autobiography must therefore begin with a genetic code. After all, it's in the genes. Um, such genomically influenced life writing 
is autobiogenography, as I have termed it elsewhere, wherein the individual moves from individual personal self-fashioning around available genetic data to a genosocial self. However, as Haraway would alert us, this autobiogenography is scripted through and within a merger of scientific data with specific social conditions, even as social conditions are read backwards into molecular data. Uh, some of you might be aware of the controversial genetic tests which proved, for example, that blacks were inherently prone to violence and X species or races or communities are predisposed towards certain kind of uh, behavioral patterns. Uh, the bell curve debate is arguably one of the more famous ones. When expanded into genetic prosog prosopography, the language of scientific discovery of genetic origins and links between populations uh, appropriates ethnographic data of say linguistic groups and cultural analysis of endogamous marriages, caste practices, diaspora, and recasts it in the language of gene pools and gene distribution. The gene is made to provide the testimony to cultural practices and historically evolved behaviors. My first section deals with ge genomic histories and cultural genomics. If individual personhood is now increasingly defined in terms of blood pressure, sugar, and cholesterol levels, uh, the biomedical autobiographies we all indulge in, in the case of collectives, prosopographies are genomic, seeking the chemical links, DNA, that demonstrate filiations. But the ge genetic history of communities cannot be read as distinct from the imbrication of these genes in socio-cultural practices, such as caste relations, labor norms, and marriage roles. For this reason, genetic citizenship has been queried for a biological determinism that excludes things like oral histories, tribal creation, myths and stories, culture, in other words, that constitute a native sense of belonging. There's plenty of material uh, on the problems that indigenous tribes and aboriginals have with uh, genetic databasing, specifically projects like the Human Genome Project, uh, which has uh, IBM, the Department of Energy, and Nat Geo working together to produce the Human Genome Variation Project. Uh, genetic prosopography reveals a history of genetic science that is imbued with the dualism of active and passive culture and nature, human and animal, social and natural, as Haraway puts it. If population genetics at one point recalled an earlier version of humanism, which instead of a hierarchy of races spoke of the united family of man, the current discourse of genetic connections, like the concept of population in the mid 20th century, functions as a unifying discourse. Um, as Haraway points out, in this, a psychological adaption, adaptationism was built into biology. Today, cultural linkages are built into biological interpretations or are explained by them. Finally, living processes and matter from consciousness to genetic memory, as biosemiotics will tell us, are founded on reading and interpreting signs of the environment to the life forms, of various parts of the life form to other parts, and of the life form to the setting. Numerous instances of scientific collective biographies for India, where genetic data seeks to explain cultural boundaries or practices and media reports on these scientific accounts have appeared since 2000. One study announced that genetic, quote, genetic mixing in India ended 1900 years ago, around the same time that the caste system was being codified in Indian religious texts. Another report noted that the gypsies or the Roma of Europe are connected to specific communities in India. These are all um, news reports that I'm citing. I also have stuff from uh, genetic data published in New Genetics and Society and other journals. A group of population geneticists discovered that, quote, five ancestral populations, not two as inferred earlier, spawned the tapestry of India's present day population diversity. Prosopographies of the Indian subcontinent have isolated two categories, ancestral North Indians, the ANI, and ancestral South Indians, the ASI. Genetically, the ANI are closest to current day Europeans, where the ASI are, whereas the ASI are closest to the disappearing Ong. But neither of these shared ancestries is recent. Indians seem to have a unique set of ancestries for e which each population is the same with respect to common descent from two major peoples, but different by virtue of its ancestry proportions and uh, specific genomic content inherited. These are, uh, I'm citing this from sources dating back to 2009, 2012, and 2016. Human development and the process of civilization are mapped in terms of admixtures of genetic materials. Um, two authorities that I'm quoting say, we also predicted that there might have been two ancestral groups in prehistoric India, an ancestral North Indian population distantly related to those in the Middle East, Central Asia, and Europe, 
and an ancestral South Indian population not related to groups outside of India. The extant uh, Indian populations are admixtures of both ANI and ASI. Having interpreted ancestry and collective lineages of entire communities in terms of the biochemical basis that make up the forms of life, these genetic prosopographies swerve into cultural genomics. The question of genetic heredity, inheritance, lineages, and community linkages are framed within other forms of identity marking. One can think of cultural genomics then as narratives mapping modes of genetic transmission onto cultural practices. Cultural genomics as an instance of Haraway's nature culture is extensively employed in the genetic prosopographies of India. DNA as a mode of inheritance and transmission is mapped onto language as a mode. It is a historically organized distinction, and this is the crucial part. It is a historically organized distinctions with attendant economic and social discrimination around castes, communities, and even families that enable the geneticists to isolate gene varieties. Uh, to map differences and trace similarities. So when the test reports are published, they say we went to the this speaking, this language speaking tribe or that community. It is because those communities are historically mapped that you track their genetic code, not the other way around. So you first look at the historically constituted communities and then say, oh, and that is the genetic code of these communities. So which came first? Um, Haraway cautions that the scientific practice must be recritiqued at the level of values and not just facts. Although what counts as facts itself is a historically determined condition because the meanings emerging from scientific practices make meanings for real people accounting for situated lives. This insistence on situated lives with all its appurtenances of meaning systems, epistemologies and cultural codes now read back from genetic data ought to constitute the subject of any critique of cultural genomics. Every tribal community and caste group in India has its own symbolic system, perhaps callable as uh, nameable as memes, passed on from generation to generation, encoding the memory of that community. When reading the genetic code, the geneticists inevitably also read these cultural codes of endogamy or linguistic differences to name just two. Genetic variation is employed to explain cultural differences and demographic variations whose origins may have nothing to do with gene pools, uh, discursive strategy central to cultural genomics. A community's cultural memory and practices that seek to reinforce such memory of a collective then are also communicable and constitute the scheme for evolution and, by extension, adaptation. Genetic inheritances cannot be isolated from the fourth mode of evolution, the cultural and the symbolic. Uh, biologists would not uh, pay much value to questions of cultural and symbolic evolution. Even the very idea of the family is not always constructed around mere genetic inheritances as the African Americans have consistently argued. Rather, forms of communication that are historical, uh, that are historical become more relevant in the performance of kinning. There are two parts to this discourse of cultural genomics. In the first part, in all genetic prosopographies around caste and community in contemporary India, genomes are approached via cultural categories. Thus, whereas human nature has always been seen as a foundation for human culture, this quote-unquote natural genetic identity and origin can only be approached via the cultural norm of social groupings. Two, there is an insistence on cultural codes and practices as evidence of genetic purity, mixing or stoppage of mixing, suggesting an incipient biological reductionism where the genetic material is seen as incontrovertible evidence for social organization, but which can also, when read against the grain, demonstrate the role of culture in influencing genetic expression. The second inverts the first, in one sense, although both strands run together. The DNA of, say, Andamanese aboriginals or South Indians becomes the object of investigation precisely because there are geographically, politically and culturally distinct groups that enable the geneticists to narrow the focus onto communities, races, tribes or castes. These are replaced by gene pools as a form of categorization and identification. For instance, here is a paragraph about genetic ancestries. Quote, we filtered out data from 49 individuals with the following characteristics six Pakistani groups that had previously been shown to have a complex history involving more than a simple mixture of two ancestral populations, which led us to exclude all Austro-Asiatic and Tibeto-Burman speakers. That is, these historically not genetically constituted categories then offer the genetic source code. That's the point I'm making. You first look at the cultural categorizations, the historically marked categories. 
Uh, these constituted categories then offer the genetic source code to be unraveled as supposedly incontrovertible proof of their quote unquote natural categorization. That is, the geneticist first recognizes the cultural and geographically distant tribe or race and then proceeds to unpack the genetic identity of that tribe or race. The very categorization as a tribe or race is a historical cult cultural one that precedes the genetic identification of them as a distinct or connected tribe or race. In a direct critique of one such study of the Indian caste system and genetic citizenship, Yulia Agarova writes, the very fact that the Indian populations in the study were sampled by groups which had always been historical in sociology known as castes made it possible for the scientists to highlight statistically significant genetic differences precisely between these groups and castes. Genetic identification requires an adherence to historically constructed cultural categories in which the prosopographic genetic narrative is then retrospectively read as explanations for their distinctiveness or similarity. The second strand in cultural genomics is the na nature of cultural evidence gathered from genetic material. Basu et al. Um, f find evidence for the genetic biological inheritance of traits in cultural mechanisms of inheritance. Quote, the hypothesis that the root of A and I is in Central Asia is further bolstered by recent evidence derived from analysis of ancient DNA samples and linguistic studies. Most of these people all open their studies by referencing the linguistic categories in India. Linguistic categories are merged with genetic categories, although several geneticists are agree that the language shift is not always coterminous with genetic shifts or admixing. Quote, each linguistic group in India has a strong genetic affinity between its members. Therefore, any recent change in language could be reflected in the genome. Having found linguistic evidence for genetic matches and differences, genetic prosopographies next dwell on social hierarchies and the notorious Indian caste system, by demonstrating how gene admixing was governed by cultural context and socio-political necessities. So at some point they will say, uh, the admixture of genes stopped in Indian history. And there is a description which goes like this. We have provided evidence that gene flow ended abruptly with the defining imposition of some social values and norms. The reign of the ardent Hindu Gupta rulers, known as the age of Vedic Brahmanism, was marked by strictures laid down in the Dharma Shastra, the, Indian, the ancient compendium of moral laws and principles for religious duty and righteous conduct, and enforced through the powerful state machinery. These strictures and enforcements resulted in a shift to endogamy. The evidence of more recent admixture among the Maratha is in agreement with the known history of the post-Gupta Chalukya and the Rashtrakuta empires of Western India. Media reports covering these studies encapsulate the tensions involved in reading too much into the biochemical nature of castes. Several of these people have argued that genetic sources still about 1885 years before the present, there has been a problem. And uh, uh, the way they read it is like this. The period of around 1900 to 4,200 years before the present, was a time of profound change in India, characterized by the de-urbanization of the Indus civilization, increasing population density in the central and downstream portions of the Gangetic system, shifts in burial practices, and the likely first appearance of Indo-European languages and Vedic religion. The shift from widespread mixture to strict endogamy that we document is mirrored in ancient Indian texts. The evolution of Indian text during this period provides confirmatory support as well as context for our genetic findings. That's, the, that's where the issue lies. Other studies similarly can only read the genetic composition of populations in India via caste organiz uh, the organization of castes and genetic data is used to account for endogamy and other practices that serve as the cultural religious borders of communities and caste groups. When the studies address genetic isolation, there is an entirely different discourse in operation. A statement like traditionally, this is a quote, traditionally Indian uh, lower caste Dravidian and tribal groups tend to have lower portion, proportions of ANI ancestry than traditionally upper caste and Indo-European groups. This could very well be read in terms of the social prohibitions based, uh, uh, placed upon the lower castes. The genetic material in the community moves towards an admixture when the organism humans move towards newer places. The human reads the signs from the environment, drought in one instance, and moves to better climates. And if you look at the Nat Geo document, documentary, The Journey of Man, it maps this in particular, that drought conditions, flooding, or other inimical conditions in the ecosystem force 
people, large populations to move. Um, so the human reads the signs from the environment and moves to better climes and consequently breeds with and in a new place or gene pool. The signs and traces of the community's movements in history are writ in the ge genetic prosopography within the admixed genetic material of today. In other words, socio-cultural movements and migrations are read back from genetic materials. Questions of social en uh, empowerment, discrimination, prohibitions, and norms such as caste divisions, rules around endogamy or labor are central to the genetic organization of Indian society here. If the first strand uses language groups and cultural practices as evidence for genetic connections, the second strand demonstrates how biochemical processes, gene admixing, were influenced by hierarchic formations and their concomitant strictures. Social norms therefore divided the people, it divided the genes. Critical cultural studies of genomics, cultural genomics, have noted that genetic evidence is appropriated to explain or reinforce in some cases social hierarchies. The assumption of genetic material as offering incontrovertible evidence of caste origins uh, once again demonstrates how it is impossible to speak of the biochemical foundations of life without addressing the cultural genomics that frame them. In each of these uh, about studies, genetic studies, the scientific discourse maps onto the cultural, suggesting the unavoidable conundrum of examining nature without culture and vice versa. Geneticists note that caste boundaries are drawn, reinforced and implemented through prohibitions against exogamy, for instance, and divisions of labor. Now the caste division is predicated upon forms of labor where certain professions are deemed hereditary. Uh, the term is important that the, the professions are also hereditary. Locating genetic prosopography within political economy, we recognize how genetically inherited traits like say skin color define social identities only minimally. They are overwhelmingly determined by inherited economics, politics and culture. My second section is called the future genomics. Genetic prosopographies while tracing ancestry make projections and offer possibilities, some of them unwittingly, founded on biochemical stories and cultural genomics. Genetic futures of communities and individuals mediated through Haraway's socialist feminist interpretation of science alert us to a crucial but hitherto neglected point. Genetic materials find expression within specific social conditions framed by economics, structures of research, including funding, healthcare, and welfare measures. That is, the future genomics must be situated genomics so that the knowledge of genetic futures must be linked to developments in agendas of social justice. Questions of genetic vulnerability, uh, it's not yet a category that has been um, theorized much. Questions of genetic vulnerability must inform debates around and narratives of genetic prosopographies. Haraway noted that the extraction, testing, and patenting of biogenetic material from indigenous communities is taken as a source of knowledge of the history of uh, human migrations and medicine. So it might be of some interest to uh, uh, faculty from English departments that the postcolonial critic Rajeshri Sundarajan's son actually works in uh, this particular domain. He, he works extensively on biogenomics and the cultures of genetic inheritances. Um, but it's rarely imbued with any concern with the welfare or livelihoods of these communities. Contemporary genomic projects attempt to remedy this lacuna. The potential exists, supposedly, in anticipating diseases among specific groups of, vary of people based on their genetic histories to enable what is called predictive medicine. And uh, India has a large consortium, the Indian Genome Variation Consortium, which declares the IGV project aims at developing informative markers for predictive medicine using both repeats and single nucleotide polymorphisms within genes in Indian subpopulations. It's a 2005 study. Another study states that the results implied that genetic studies of disease in Indians are hopelessly inadequate unless they account for their specific ancestries. Cultural genomics makes visible the fact that for genetic data, even in predictive medicine to be actualized, a careful social sorting will be essential since cultural frames enable genetic identification. Genetic data will lead naturally to cultural classification of quote unquote at risk populations. The identification of genetic risks or genetic susceptibility to one or more of a range of genetically transmitted diseases can create new ambiguous categories of persons who are neither perfectly healthy, healthy nor clinically sick, but are only at risk. Um, cancer narratives, uh, people who study cancer will tell you about the pre-viver category. Those who expect to have cancer, they are not survivors, they are pre-vivers. In, uh, and studies of um, 
uh, people who uh, are at risk from Huntington's disease, like Alice Wexler's text, also talk about uh, pre-vivers. Um, while risk is not confined to genetic constitutions, and there are many risks defined by lifestyle and other circumstances, the estimation of genetic risk, and this is the fair point I was making, while risk is not confined to genetic constitutions, and there are many risks defined by lifestyle and other circumstances, the estimation of genetic risk is a new technology of medical classification. That is what is worrying. Um, DNA testing kits will be available to buy off the counter any day now. You know? um, it has larger ramifications. If you're prone to certain kinds of illness, there'll be no insurance company that will provide insurance cover for you. Employers will not hire you if in 15 years time you are likely to suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome. So eventually with your CVs, which will be less important, uh, it will be your genetic data that has to be uh, submitted. Uh, people have worked on it extensively and there's a new term for it, genetic racisms. Uh, there is therefore an intimate relationship between the changing boundaries and classifications of genetic disease and the shifting categories of patienthood and personal identity. Such a surveillance and sorting apart, a genetic prosopography around caste and communities deflects attention away from the dominant causes of national and global disparities in patterns of advantage and disadvantage. Um, disease is not only genetically determined, access to healthcare, quality control of the pharma industry, distribution of research funding in the medical sciences are socioeconomic and political factors have an equally important role in influencing which populations experience health and which ones experience sickness. An emphasis on genetic inherited inequality may then deflect attention from social, political and economic inequalities among castes and communities. For instance, physiognomies, immunity, skin color and even cranial structure are dependent upon not just genes but on elements like diet and nutrition. This means the availability of a sustaining environment with adequate food determines these corporeal features no matter what the genetic composition of the individual. That's the key. Arguments in favor of the genetic lottery that then determines one's cause of life ignores the social structures in which life is lived. More than the genetic lottery, it is the access to healthcare, genetic testing and medical research that impacts any community. Thus, it is social justice that trumps genetic inevitability. Haraway's insistence on the community's access to the latest research to alter the course of their supposedly genetically predetermined future pays attention to the social structures, including the biomedical, but is not restricted to it, in which genetic expressions may be examined and controlled. Uh, in the early 2000s, when uh, pharmacogenomics was just beginning to get off the ground, um, the, the American pharma industry said, we will collect DNA from various groups and start designing medicines for them. So every genetic group will have its associated medic uh, medical testing devices and, 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 and uh, products. Um, by uh, strange coincidences that happens in pharma and any research, the African-Americans had been left out of the classification. Uh, Fatima Jackson, the world's leading commentator on genetics and race, pointed out that this means that effectively in 15 years time, there will be no medication for the blacks. Absolutely none, because there's simply no research funding available for testing their DNA, collating their DNA and developing medicines for them. Uh, Fatima Jackson's intervention in the early 2000s uh, and some essays uh, written on genetic racisms uh, changed the course of that particular research trajectory. The life story of a community can be read via its instances of genetically determined futures, but for social justice, these must be located within the coterminous or not evolution of healthcare systems and welfare measures for the genetically vulnerable. The genetically vulnerable become genetically helpless. I'm using the distinction between, uh, between vulnerability and helplessness by Adriana Cavarraro, who argues that all of us are vulnerable because we are mortals, but not all of us are helpless. There's a huge distinction between them. So the, the shift in emphasis in healthcare or biomedical research transforms the genetically vulnerable into the genetically helpless. The genetically vulnerable become genetically helpless when research on their condition is inadequate and the research does not translate into healthcare systems or for instance, insurance policies. Genetic expression might alter even when there is no change in the genetic code so that factors like feeding habits, levels of nutrition or social setting can alter behavior. 
Unexpected phenotypic outcomes can proceed from the switching on or off of the genetic code. Nature then is subsumed under culture in epigenetic narratives where lifestyle can induce changes in gene expression as early as in utero life. Epigenetics even allows for the inheritance of modified features, modified in response to the environment over a few generations, as Maurizio Meloni, whose observations resonate with Haraway's insistence on the social embedding of, of science research and policy, argues, quote, identifying genetics with a lottery implies understanding it as operating blindly and immunely from the distortions of social structures. Uh, as a result, uh, Priscilla Wald and others have made a case for building on Benedict Anderson for imagined immunities, uh, borders of communities that are assumed to be immune. And later, in an epigenetic view, the genetic lottery, such as genetic transmission plus genetic expression, is always influenced by the social disparities of the past, from individual behaviors like smoking to social processes such as war, poverty, or injustice. The cultural habits of communities engendered it due to reasons as diverse as poverty and social sanctions, and caste would be a great example here, are intrinsic to their genetic expressions. Genetic data implicitly positions groups of people within new social hierarchies, thanks to the overwhelming power of cultural genomics and the cultural authority of genetic data. Predetermined genetic identities are deemed final and irrevocable, thereby reducing the emphasis on social conditions. So you're able to say that these communities are automatically predisposed to certain conditions and you then have to do nothing about social justice issues. Genetic variations have to be seen therefore within the cultural context of social hierarchization. Genetic prosopography requires the leavening insights of every genetics that signposts the role of culture in determining biological changes. When writing in or out entire populations through an emphasis on genetics as nature, the historically oppressed lose their locus standi as a disadvantage unless we recognize that their so-called genetic structures are culturally determined. To conclude, when Haraway therefore calls for a clearer under, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, those occupying the lower rungs of the social order of caste in India will experience a torsion when data about genetic linkages are revealed. Applying this argument to dogs, uh, Haraway argues that their biographies and their classifications are a relation of talk. The larger point in Haraway's argument about torsion is that systems of classification are often at odds with lived experience. When therefore Haraway calls for a clearer understanding of the complex she terms nature culture, genetic prosopography that relies however unwittingly on cultural frames can be suitably nuanced to account for epigenetic evolution that would then serve the cause of social justice. Refusing a genetic prosopography, the preeminence usually accorded to quote unquote scientific truths would be essential if one has to accept that all biological life is precarious life and what prevents the precarity from destroying life is sustainable environments cultured to produce safe living conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nair, for this wonderful talk. Honestly speaking, when, uh, when I read the topic, hardly did I have any idea about that it's going to be truly interdisciplinary um, research paper. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, uh, so this would be bringing in the issues like human development, genetic codes, culture and uh, uh, kind of war, justice, poverty, everything together. It's been a wonderful paper for all of our audience. Whether we, you are into linguistics research or cultural studies or for that matter, religion studies or diaspora studies, I'm sure you're going to get insights from this paper. So thank you, Professor, for this wonderful talk. Uh, and with this, we are almost moving towards the completion of the event. And as they say, all good things, they come to an end. So since we are nearing towards completion, I request Professor Srilata to offer a formal vote of thanks. Good evening. On behalf of Professor Sornalata and Dr. Abhishek, I would like to thank the following. The director, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Professor Umakant Dash, head HSS, Professor Nagarajan, former dean INAR and the office of the INAR, Dr. Padmaja Anand, Vice President OBS, our special guest speakers, Professor Pramod, Professors Pramod Nair and Michael Yates, our team of student readers, Mridula Roberts, Ranjani Srinivasan, Dr. Anandita Sahu for her anchoring, NPTEL, the Media Cell, Mr. Sashi, Ms. Suguna, Mr. Arun, students Divya and Mohit 
for their photography, technical, media, and logistical support. And last but not the least, audience for showing up and for being for remaining so engaged right through this wonderful event. Thank you.